Hey everybody, it's Dr. Greg Jones, and I am so excited for our next podcast with Dr. Suzanne Faree. She is an amazing doc, an amazing expert in peptide therapy. But before I talk about that, Dr. Faree, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about peptides. We're going to talk about my new book. We might talk about some skincare and how to get rid of wrinkles. We might talk about how to grow some hair back, how to get some muscles, how to recover faster from your procedures or surgeries or from injuries. So this podcast is for everyone because who doesn't have at least one of those things? So we're looking forward to it and we will see you soon. Peptides, small chains of amino acids that our body uses as signaling molecules have exploded in popularity over the last few years, revolutionizing the way we lose weight and build muscle and heal from injuries and heal our gut, and reduce inflammation and, and treat chronic disease. Unfortunately, peptides are not taught in medical school, and it can be really challenging to find a provider who knows peptides, knows how to use them, knows what to look for, and plus there's so much information on the internet that who knows what to do. In today's podcast, we have a pioneer in the field of peptide therapy. So my guest today, Dr. Suzanne Faree, is a true pioneer in peptide therapy. She's a senior physician at Biomedical Associates in Atlanta, Georgia, where she specializes in cutting-edge therapies such as bioidentical hormone replacement and peptide therapy and neurotherapy and so much more. Not only that, she is an esteemed professor at Emory University teaching medical students in the next wave of great doctors. And on top of that, she's recently added author to her title with the title of her new book, Counterclockwise. And I'm going to let her talk more about that. But the book's amazing. And it's a great reference for those who want to know about peptide therapy and know how it really works and how it can help you out. So welcome to the show, Dr. Faree. Thanks so much, Dr. Jones. So nice to see you. So I always start these shows off with like, how did you get here? Because again, the things I talked about, the bioidentical hormone replacement, the neural therapy, the peptide therapy, they don't teach this in med school, right? Unless mm -hmm. something's changed down there in Atlanta that I don't know about. So how did you get from getting out of med school getting to residency and becoming the doctor you are today. Greg, this is uh, probably my biggest point of passion right now is the distance between bench medicine and clinical practice where um, there's so much research that's out there on so many different subjects that almost never makes it actually to the um, to the clinic or where we actually see patients. And if it does, it's 20 years after the research was started. So having patients, as I'm sure you do, that are sick but don't show up with illness on the typical testing or that have don't respond to typical pharmaceutical therapies. Um, so it came to me both because of patients but because of my own injury. So patients were coming, they were they were clearly not well, but they didn't have the classic things and they didn't or they didn't respond to classic treatments. So doing research, doing research, trying to figure out how do I help them? And then my own injury, I this was maybe around seven years ago, maybe a little bit longer than that, probably 10 now years ago. I was injured and was looking for a way to heal myself. And as I had already been in functional medicine for a period of time, I went to a conference for A4M. And at the conference, I attended one of the smaller venues where I heard someone speak about mechanogrowth factor, which is one of the peptides that our bodies naturally make. And that... Uh, is involved in the repair process. It's released at the site of an injury and allows for repair. So we, uh, someone smarter than me, was able to take that and extend the life of it so it could be injected and used in the body to um, allow for repair, especially as we age. We don't make these peptides quite as much. So uh, we can inject them exogenously made from some, a synthetic source. And then we have the uh, ability to heal uh, much like a more youthful um, person would be able to. Yeah, MGF is an amazing. We're going to talk more about that. That is an amazing peptide, and we've been using it a lot. And a lot of our athletes use it, but those are into like fitness and bodybuilding because it's like, okay, you can go down this path, and here's all the, all the things, right? We can say the names. Oh, here's the the Anavar, which you can't even get anymore. So there's that. So that that changed a lot. And then it's just like, okay, what can you do to help people not just build muscle, but just all the other benefits of that peptide? I'm looking forward to talking about that more. So. So you're uh, board certified in family medicine, number one, right? And you have another one in... Anti-aging and regenerative medicine. 
Okay. Yeah, that's the F A A R M. I think there's like a couple of those, right? There's yeah, yes. So I did their I did A four M's board certification, and then I did their fellowship. Okay, gotcha. Mm -hmm. I'm actually in the middle of that right now. Actually doing the the farm. So I'm. Yeah, it's great. It's definitely worth it. It's a fire hose to the face. It really is. I did the neuro module and I was like, ah, oh, this is a lot, you know? And then it's just mm -hmm. like, we all have a little medical school PTSD. Like, why am I doing this again? I did this already, mm -hmm. you know? So it's a great thing to do. And so are, are you still teaching down at Emory? No, I stopped teaching there. I was, I taught there for about 17 years. It was a long time and uh, stopped teaching a, a couple of years ago when my practice got a lot smaller. I went from you, taking insurance to no longer taking insurance, and I just didn't have enough patience to keep the students coming. But I taught for them for a long time. And so that's great because now you get to see, you probably see some of those docs now. Do you ever see them at the conferences? Like some of the- Yes, it's so fun. Uh, it's got to be mm -hmm. really cool. So let's kind of circle back to peptide therapy. So you got your introduction at an A4M conference and learn about it there. So how long have you been doing uh, peptides in your practice? Uh, uh, right away after that conference. So I went to that conference and then I did their follow-up intro course that they did. And uh, so since then, I think I started with BPC-157, something like that. Thymus and Alpha-1, something simple. Uh, just to get my foot in the door and started just treating patients as best I could. Uh, BPC-157, because it was oral, was an easy one to start with. And who doesn't have patients that have gut problems? I mean, almost everything is starts with the gut. So that's an easy start. Indeed, indeed. Okay. Well, awesome. So this is the fun part is now we get to talk about peptide therapy in detail. I've been looking forward to this and we got a lot. Do now we got a little bit of time, but we're going to make this amazing, like we said before the show. So, I'm going to ask you the simple question. I'm sure that you have answered a million trillion times, and it's going to be in the book. We'll talk about the book as well. But when a pa you you got the patient in front of you, they're just meeting you. They're like, "Oh my god, I got these this things going on. Traditional medicine is not working." And then you're like, "Well, I got something for you. I got these peptides." And just in case they have been living under a medical rock, and they're like, "Peptides? What's that?" How do you answer that question? So um, I, I, I will tell them, think about a chicken breast. This is made of protein, right? And everyone knows that. And so proteins are strings of amino acids. This is uh, building blocks of your body. Strings of amino acids that are greater than 150 amino acids in length. In your body, those proteins are broken down. We know that. That makes sense. You think about eating and digestion. Those proteins are broken down into smaller fragments that have their own jobs. And those smaller fragments, if they're between 50 and 150 amino acids, we call them polypeptides. If they're under 50 amino acids, we call them peptides. If they're under four amino acids, we call them bioregulator peptides. And that's just our convention. There's nothing magical about those terms. It's just so that we all are speaking the same language. So they're just small fragments of protein, which are which have jobs in the body. The tiniest ones are actually able to enter into the cell and change the expression of DNA, which is pretty cool. The uh, larger ones bind to the outside of the cell and cause things to happen inside the cell in a cascade sort of formula. And um, the most famous one is insulin. That's been around a long time. Everybody has heard of insulin. And uh, actually, Dr. Pavlov, Pavlov's dog, was originally working on peptides in the intestine. So that he wasn't necessarily working with dogs ringing bells. He was talking about uh, pept about intestinal peptides. And so that was back in the 1920s. And we have learned more and more and more and more since then. The most famous one is insulin. There are several other fa famous ones like bacitracin, which people use for uh, anti as a topical antibiotic. The other famous one is um, growth hormone. Lots of people are familiar with that from bodybuilding. But this is, I think, so much more than a bodybuilding hormone. And then uh, the other one that's famous is the blood pressure medicine called Losar. A lot of people take that very common generic blood pressure medicine. So uh, they're out there. They're everywhere. The new class of weight loss drugs that are by injection, the semaglutide and other similar GLP-1s, those are all peptide um, 
synthetic peptides, analog uh, analogs of our natural GLP-1 peptide. And when I say analog, I mean they're very similar. They're made in the lab. They're slightly modified. The other one that's that's famous now is the um, CGRP um, agonists, which are um, for uh, prescribed by the FDA or or um, that's that was Freudian, wasn't it? They are um, <laughs> encouraged by the FDA or approved by the FDA for migraine treatment. Okay. Amazing. And so one of the things I, when people ask me, the patients ask me that people don't ask me on the streets. I don't know why I said people. I was just like coming up to me at the gym, like what's that pack? So, you know, I always kind of talk to help people relate. I'm like, think about everyone knows what a, most people know what a general contractor does, right? It's like, Hey, you have a job, you're building a house, you're building a building, you got a GC. And so I would say, think of that peptide that you're injecting like a GC, right? And it really depends on the job that needs to be done. Sometimes a general contractor needs to hire one group. I just need to hire a plumber. Sometimes they need to hire several people to get the job done. These are more of that pleiotropic peptides that do a lot of different things. And I'm like, that general contractor, at nine times out of 10, he's not coming up there banging on the hammer, screwing things in. He's hiring people to do the job where peptides are the same thing. It's like, I'm going to tell your body what to do. I ain't doing it. I can't even get in the cell all the way. I can send, I can make a phone call to get in the cell and get the right people to do the job. And I think people relate to that and they're like, oh yeah, that's it. And that's where we say it's kind of safe because maybe that general, this is the safety thing, right? That maybe that general contractor shouldn't be in there doing the plumbing, especially he's hiring someone else. And that's where sometimes, cause that, that, that peptide is only going to go where it needs to go. It's not going to do what it's not supposed to do. And 99% of the time. So I think that helps people relate to. So that's kind of how kind of a junior doctor and a peptide stuff can kind of relate that, especially if we're trying to get people to understand it because it's simple, but not so simple. Right. So that being said, so you do a lot of really, really cool stuff in your, in your practice, right. With the hormones and the neural therapy and regenerative medicine, how do you integrate peptide therapy and some of these other great modalities that you're doing? Well, we know that a lot of the peptides are helpful in supporting the other uh, modalities to be effective. So, for example, let's say someone comes in for uh, hair loss. We will um, combine some PRP or PRF, which is platelet-rich fibrin matrix, with the uh, a couple of the different peptides that are involved in hair, re hair recovery or hair growth. And um, be because that that uh, PRF, which is a regenerative therapy, will um, stay in place. It sort of acts like a fiber matrix and holds the peptides in place. It makes them effective in place for longer than they would be otherwise, because otherwise they just get dispersed really quickly. So we'll combine those together. Some of the peptides will help the um, stem cells that you may uh, be um, giving to people to and appreciate their environment longer. That they'll, you know, you've taken them out of, let's say, abdominal fat, or you've taken them from Wharton's jelly or wherever, and now you're putting them into a foreign environment. If you pair them with some peptides, we know that that is beneficial. There's been several studies where thymosin beta-4 has been used to support stem cells as they are injected into cardiac muscle immediately following a um, an infarct or a, a heart attack. And so uh, that's one way that's, that's really well studied using the combination. We also know that almost everyone who has, let's say, a traumatic brain injury or um, a stroke will also have intestinal dysfunction at the same time. So we almost always will throw on a BPC to help with both the brain and the intestinal um, distress that can occur from traumatic brain injury and stroke as well. Um, there's so much research in these peptides on in mostly in animals, but there is there is some increasing amount of evidence using them in uh, humans as well. So that's what's most exciting is getting involved in the research and being aware of what research is out there and the increasing amount of human studies that are uh, that are there for um, for us to draw from. That's so cool. Because they get to use them as part of that bigger picture and bigger plan and just even accelerate or just make things that you're trying to do just work even better. Mm -hmm. That's really, really cool. All right, Suzanne. So let's talk about this because, you know, the cat's kind of out of the bag. You know, there was the, the a night that lives in infamy, I believe it was September 29th, 2023. In the middle of the night, it was a Friday night where we got this email from the FDA saying that a lot of our best and most amazing peptides were being changed to category two. And this category two thing, while it's directed at compound pharmacies, 
it affects the doctors because we can't get the peptides out of the compound pharmacy. So it's taking place for the doctors too. And this letter basically said, hey, we don't think these peptides should be made anymore. Just kind of stop what you're doing, right? And there's been a lot of energy going on about this. So peptides are in a really, really interesting state right now where a lot of patients are confused because they're calling the doctor like, oh my God, they're banned. Can I get them anymore? What do we do? And we have to kind of talk people off the ledge. So, hey, this is where we are right now. So from your perspective, where are we with the current state of peptide therapy? So I think the first thing that we need to realize is when patients are coming back to us really pushing back, we have to talk to them about what's the reason why they're pushing back and what's their, what is their fear? What is their concern? What do they need from us? So rather than immediately becoming defensive, I think the most important thing is to engage them in what does the patient really need from us around this? Is it more information? Is it a different option? Are they just, they're done. They are not interested at all. Let's stop this all together. Because I think we need to honor whatever their experiences and whatever their fears are. Um, At the same time, I think we need to uh, be people who educate. And so what we need to understand about this is that um, the compounding pharmacies have what's happened is they've been told they're no longer allowed to compound them. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are banned because they're not safe. It doesn't, there's, that's not something that's come up. There's not a, a, there's not, that's not a problem uh, or something that we know about. This isn't because they are under, you know, they, they've given people side effects or problems. This is, there's a lot of possible reasons why this is happening. And I could certainly give you my opinion or my conjecture that is not founded in anything that I know of. It's just what I presume. Uh, the what One of the things we know that's happening is that the, and, and we're really grateful for compounding pharmacies for this, is because of the huge shortage that's happened to, for these weight loss drugs that we've been, or weight loss peptides that we've been using for several years, because of the huge shortage, they called on the compounding pharmacies to make, to help with the shortage. And they've really stepped up to the plate. And now as the pharmaceutical companies are pulling back and saying, hey, we're going to be able to create these, I'm curious about how much that has to play into this decision. I'm, you know, I don't know that for sure. And of course, I'm not a member of the FDA to be able to make an intelligent uh, comment about it. But the, the, the timing is awfully coincident. What I think is really exciting is to watch our compounding pharmacies become so creative and to see them, you know, the two that, that I'm sure you use, the same two that I use or that, you know, I majority use, they are saying, all right, let's pivot and let's find some other peptides that are going to be able to do because there's thousands and thousands and thousands of peptides. There's no reason we have to be disappointed about the ones that are there. So I think this is the father of ingenuity, and it's kind of exciting to see what we're going to be able to do in the next several years. I mean, all the new peptides that just came out at the A4M conference, that's really exciting. We've got a bunch new that we're rolling out in the conference in the fall. So it's uh, to watch all of these scientists and exciting, like I was talking about at the beginning, that gap between bench medicine and clinical medicine is shortening. It's decreasing because, and the FDA has just allowed us to do that. So that's what's exciting. And I'm excited to see what the future holds for our patients. Probably we can come out with better peptides rather than getting stuck with the ones we made all the time. Now we're coming up with new um, and better things that are going to do more and help our patients better. So in the end, I think it's going to be a win. I think it will be too. And I think what's really interesting is that there are some peptides that I learned about in the beginning when I first started learning about peptides. And it's, oh, this seems really cool. And then it just kind of faded away because, you know, we're even in medicine, we're still the shiny new toy community. Yes. It's like, oh, look at this shiny new peptide. I forgot all about that. And then now we're being for we're kind of being forced to relearn some of these peptides. Like, oh, wait a minute, lorazotide is amazing. And wait a minute, oh, what's this all about? Like, wait, there's a there's there's Tess Morellin. Oh my God, there's some oral. And anyway, so I don't want to get, you know, so there's things that we just kind of faded away from that are still there, you know, and I'm excited for the future of peptides too. And some of these new ones, which I'm looking at, like, wow, this looks, the name is different. Wow. This looks just like 
insert the name of the peptide here and how it works. And so yeah. the future is, is brighter than we like to think it is too. So, so that was really cool. And thank you for sharing that. Cause I know like there's a lot of like, eh, we really want to talk about that, but it, I think we, we have to, right. Because eventually we're all, because again, the good thing about it is that the, the pharmacy is like, they didn't say, Hey, stop. If you got them, they didn't say stop doing it, but if you have them, you're still able to use them. And eventually that, that that's shortening. Right. And eventually we're all going to have to pivot. So I think getting that education is, is getting ahead of it. So thank you for that. So now this is the fun part here. I've been looking forward to this for a while. And a little backstory is that when I was learning peptides and I was sitting at home with my little videos here, because you know, this is getting my certifications. And I did a lot of the online stuff because I just wasn't in a position to start my practice of travel. And I got all these videos. And, and Suzanne, Dr. Faree, was giving some of these lectures like, oh my God, this is so cool. Like I really like what she's talking about. I'm learning so much. And then I was like, I never thought in three or four years, we'd be sitting here doing a podcast. So this is cool. So now I get to, because I was virtual, I couldn't raise my hand and say, what you talking about? Now I get to do that. So this is really fun for me. So I really want to kind of focus on three areas here, because again, we can talk all day about when you mention all those great things that peptides do. We can talk about this for hours, literally hours. But for the sake of time, we're going to focus on three really cool areas. And I want to start with number one, healing, because who doesn't get hurt? Who doesn't get in pain? Who doesn't have a nagging injury? Who doesn't have something that, hey, this never healed. This has been bothering me since high school. And peptides have been game changers in healing. So, so that being said, let's talk about peptides and healing, how they, re they contribute to healing, faster recovery, and all those processes of getting better. So it's pretty exciting. What we're trying to accomplish is allowing the body to go back to sport, whatever that sport is, as quickly as possible. So if you give the cell the energy that it needs, allow it to make its own energy, give it enough mitochondrial strength, the cell can recover and repair on its own. Our bodies have that innate ability. As we age, of course, those abilities decline. And so we um, we lose the ability to make some of these peptides. Um, it's one of the reasons I love testimorelin. And it is a testimorelin is a, a growth hormone secretagogue, meaning it helps to secrete your body to make its own growth hormone. Um, this has been a game changer for many of my it is FDA approved to treat HIV related. Uh, it's a condition called lipodystrophy, which is the, the placement of fat or the growth of fat in unusual places. But we know that if we're increasing growth hormone, we know that we're improving the way that the cell makes and uses energy. We're improving body composition and we're improving recovery in general. So uh, I love to call these our youth hormones instead of growth hormones because they really do help to turn back the clock on the way that your DNA expresses uh, other proteins and the way that your cells are able to recover from injury or trauma or even things like um, sun damage, pollution, where our cells are better able to handle those because of peptides like this. That's really, really cool. So with that being said, so sometimes I'll have the patient come in and they're like, hey, I got this injury. I want to avoid surgery. I want to do peptides. Oh, I've heard about peptides. Can this help me avoid surgery? And that becomes that kind of that tricky process where it's like, well, let me see your MRI before we start talking, right? Because that's yeah. going to be a huge thing. But that being said, with your experience, how often can peptides prevent that surgery or prevent that person from getting to that point where it's like, I need to go the extreme on getting healed? So it's been pretty exciting to watch uh, being able to do hip, knee, shoulder injections and be able to get keep people to keep people from having to have surgery. So I had a, a patient who had avascular necrosis of the hip, which is almost 100% uh, hip replacement surgery. This is where the blood supply to the bone itself retracts in the bone. So the end of the hip bone then is begins to die. It doesn't have um, adequate blood supply. With treatment of this patient, both uh, orally and with some systemic peptides, we were able to get her back to sport with her original hip. We restored blood flow. We were able to get it back. There is MRI change in her hip 
on the um, MRI. The radiologist actually called me and said, what did you do? I've never seen this before. So this was pretty exciting to have that um, happen with her. And she is now trains at the same gym as me. So it's really fun to get her uh, back in the gym and see her working and, and doing really well. Um, then we, I've also had several patients with meniscus tears with ACL damage and we're able to get them back to their sport. One man I can think of in particular is a, um, a pro, pro, um, not professional, but competitive cyclist. And he's able to, he's now back to, uh, cycling again after treatment with peptides in his joint. Um, his affected joint. I have an 83-year-old who uh, plays golf just for sport, just for fun, and again, able to get him back to playing. And you can imagine at 83 how critical that activity level is and recovery from injury is in someone his age because that's probably the only exercise he gets every week is going and walking the you know the little bit that he does in between cart rides <laughs> um mm -hmm. and so him being able to get back to to playing golf was really um important and his injury was just really severe arthritis of his of his knee and to get him to the point where he's able to function that's wonderful we're really excited about it Super, super cool. So shifting gears a little bit. So let's talk about peptides and athletic performance. Because again, that's a that one right there, because again, age comes for us all, right? We just can't do the same things we used to do when we we're 16, 17, 18, or in even our early 20s or mid-20s, but we still want to perform. We still want to ride our bikes and go cycling and go hiking. So what's the role of peptides in improving endurance and strength and, and overall performance? So what's interesting is they are all WADA banned. WADA is the World Anti-Doping Agency. So none of them can be used in professional athletes who are tested uh, or who are banned from doing that. So Olympians, et cetera. Um, the, they are not approved, none of them at all. However, the, the, it's interesting that there's not very much research demonstrating a significant benefit in uh, increasing strength, increasing uh, endurance, increasing speed. What's interesting is the research is really in recovery. So think about, I think about my training. So I'm, uh, I, I'm a competitive power lifter. I can go, uh, train and it takes me about a day and a half to be able to train again. I train about two hours every time I train and it requires me about a day and a half, maybe a little bit shorter to be able to recover. If I can recover in a day instead of a day and a half, then I can go back to sport faster. I can increase my strength and endurance because I'm back, I'm able to train again faster. Whereas if someone's still compared to, if I'm able to train a day later and someone else is able to train a day and a half later, that makes all the difference when you're talking about recovery and you're talking about competition. Um, and so that's what our goal is. And that's what most of the peptides do is improve recovery for quicker return to sport. And I don't just mean for trauma or injury. I mean, just for day to day, getting back to the next day of, of exercising the next day. And that's really cool. As you talked about the MGF and the kind of growth factor peptide, which is one of my favorites because of what it does for muscle recovery, right? Those, uh, I wish you had more time to talk about muscle satellite stem cells and ah, uh, goodness gracious, but it's okay. You know, with more to follow. And a lot of this stuff, you got a book. We're going to talk about that book where people can learn more of this information as well. So again, one of the things we, we were kind of preparing for the show, I was like, hey, you know, when it comes down to it, it's like, what do people, for the most part, as we get older, what do we want to do? We want to heal. We want to be active and most importantly because as we get older this right here people are watching you know listening point to my brain here is how we stay on top of our game it's how we run our businesses what we need for our families is how we literally survive because our brains become the most important part of the body in many ways as we get older so what do you feel is the importance of peptides and maintaining and improving cognitive function memory and just overall neurocognitive health yes um, so many of our patients are um, entrepreneurs who own whatever businesses that are super exciting. They travel the world to um, do whatever they're doing, and they're really passionate about what they do. And they are in their late 50s, and they're trying to, they want to maintain their cognitive ability to um, to do this big thing in the world that they feel like is huge and, and that they've become so passionate about. So in order to allow them to, to support them cognitively so they can sit in the boardroom, they can, they can be creative, 
Obviously, peptides are not a panacea. We're going to encourage you regular sleep, eating properly, exercise, managing stress, meditation, prayer, yoga, whatever your thing is, spiritual thing, um, all the things that are sort of baseline. But if we can add on top of those things, some of the peptides that are for cognition, we have, uh, we can do stacks of them for cognition. There can be such tremendous benefit. And um, we were, uh, a bunch of us were, are on a, a text thread where we were talking the other day about using even some of these GLP-1s for the um, insulin resistance that can begin to occur in the brain as we age. And so micro dosing the GLP-1 peptides for that purpose has been a fascinating conversation. There's some really interesting research that's out there about it. And so um, th this was just the conversation we were all having, uh, geeking out on uh, recent research on cognition and GLP-1s. But there's lots of peptides specifically for that, um, and they are available. They're still available out there. So it's exciting to be able to use them to help with um, patients, um, both in being creative. I have a patient who is a, who plays guitar, and he said, I can actually remember the series of chords for the entire song without having to look at the music. I can actually write a new song where I was having trouble before with actually ha with having some creativity to be able to do that. So it's fun to be able to um, assist people in getting back to what they really want to do. No, that's really cool because again, as we get older, it's just like, and I always tell patients like, you know, as we get older, I feel like, and me personally, I feel like sometimes it's way easier for me to learn things that I thought were very complex, but then it just doesn't stick. You know, it's oh. like, oh, I got it. I, it's great. I know what the next day is like, oh my God, what did I just read? And some of these peptides that we've been working with, and I, you know, obviously the names are going to change because of the things that are coming out. We were starting to use because BPC-157, amazing for brain function, and you got your C-Links and C-Maxes and your Dihexas and all these amazing peptides that we're going to have to make our changes from eventually, but they can be amazing. And then finding that right combination of what's best for that person, because that's one of the other really cool things about the art of peptide therapy is that there can be someone that looks just like you, same age as you power lifter, the whole shebang, and you're going to give that person a peptide, like, oh my God, this world changed. The next one's going to be like, meh, right? And it's just like, yeah. well, we got to look at something else, right? And then you kind of mentioned that panacea thing. And that's what I, I say this a lot. I'm like, man, peptides, this ain't magic. Ain't no magic in this syringe. There's some work that you have to do. You know, I think yeah. getting people to understand that, like you still have to eat healthy and you still have to sleep. You still have to manage stress. And I think if you use that, then that's when the magic happens because you're, you're giving the body the right signals to do its thing so thanks for sharing that so i know we got to get you up out of here but this is the point i really want to get to you have and i said it earlier you added author to your title of all yeah, the titles you got, so now, exciting. You, now you got author and the book is called counterclockwise and so i want you to brag about this book it's your so time. fun yeah. so um, I, I started it, writing it back in January a year ago and in the middle of the summer. So I just finished doing, I did it all on recordings at first. I just finished all the recordings, was ready to start writing it. And my publisher went out of business. <laughs> so my editor in there. It was just, it was a big mess. And so I had to scramble kind of last minute. It was supposed to come out in October, November. Anyway, it is finally out. So this is really exciting for me to have it out there. Um, and I, part of it, I wanted to write a book that was accessible to patients. There's several books that are out there that are um, that are for providers. I get so many questions from patients that I thought, you know, I need to write a book that's both accessible to patients but also referenced and nuanced for providers with the goal of allowing providers to be able to speak peptides to their patients. So if you're a provider and you're reading this book, hopefully it will give you ways to talk to patients about what those peptides do. And it will give you ideas of what stacks to use and what dosing to use. Um, this is really geared towards women. This book is geared towards women, although there are several applicable um, things to men in the book. Um, and so I wanted to, because the dosing in women is slightly different, I wanted to uh, specifically address them. And um, so it's it's designed to be read. You don't have to read it cover to cover. You can read one chapter. Let's say all you have is a gut problem. You go to the gut chapter and you read that. Uh, you could, if you just have a cognitive 
cognitive deficiency or um, dysfunction, you can just go to the cognitive chapter. Each chapter builds on the other. And if you read it front to back, you'll see how I think about treating my patients. And I almost always will start with gut, the gut and then the immune system. So this is, you'll see sort of how I think about treating patients and how, you know, the skin care and uh, hair loss are kind of towards the end as those are the icing on the cake as we get towards fixing, making people healthier and healthier. Uh, there are lots of deep dives. So if you're really a scientific geek, if you're kind of a biohacker, there's some things in there for you to read. But there's also some higher level, some stories about different patients that I've treated. And uh, I just wanted to make it accessible to everyone. That's awesome. So I'm, my book's in the back, my copy's in the back, but I will see you at some point in the next few months. I'm going to see you and I'm going to run up like, 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 ah, sign my book. You're going to be like, ah, of course. I'm going to surprise you with it, like out of the blue, just out of my backpack, right? So, so one thing I do want people to know about your book is this is a great plug for it. And I love the information you just put out, but where can they get it? On Amazon. Yes. It's available on Amazon. It's available the Kindle, I guess the Nook version. If you have a Nook, it's available on uh, Barnes and Noble for the Nook version. Awesome. So go get your copy. It's a great read. And it's definitely been able to get me to think about some different things. Because again, when we go through our training, it's so standard in the dose. This, which give it, this is the dose. Yeah. And it doesn't really delineate between body size and being a female and all that. And I think that information is invaluable. So before we let you go, I do want to get one thing, one more thing from you. There's a lot of doctors that may be listening, not just doctors, nurse practitioners, PAs, aspiring doctors who are listening to this podcast, hopefully, and saying, wow, this is amazing. Like, and there's this fog between where you are and where you want to be. And that's with anything in life, right? It's just like, how do you get there, right? And so what advice would you give to an aspiring medical professional practitioner on, that wants to improve their health and not only their practice through these innovative treatments? So I, I really think one of the, uh, there are several different groups out there that do education. Um, I highly recommend going through the fellowship program that I did. There are a couple of them out there. IFM and A4M are kind of the leaders that are out there. Um, when I started my fellowship program 10 years ago, the um, A4M had a way more evidence-based program, which I felt was excellent and needed, I needed that evidence-based kind of leaning. I still feel that way. Um, IFM didn't have that. They really have come very far forward now. So I think either program are great. If you're really looking at into cellular, you've, you've gotten that under your belt, that fellowship program under your belt, you understand about um, the basics of how to help patients recover and get better, et cetera, and you're really now interested in adding peptides on top of that, then I would look also at the A4M program or the SSRP program. They have some really great, um, uh, both programs do really well. They're sort of different focus on, um, you know, very um, straightforward pro uh, protocols in one program and very scientific in the other program. So really just, I would do both. Actually, I did both. I think they're both excellent programs. Great, great. Thank you for that. And before we let you get out of here, for those that want to follow your journey to keep up with all the amazing things you're doing in medicine and maybe even want to schedule a, a consultation with your practice, where can they find you? So we are Vine, as in grapevinemedical.com, vinemedical.com. And then I'm on Instagram at Dr. S. Faree, D-R-S. Faree. Amazing, amazing. And then Go get that book, y'all. If you haven't got the book, here's a chance to, it's called Counterclockwise, available on Amazon and the Nook on Kindle. We got to get this thing to some airports, some airports, bookstores. I want to see it everywhere. So I'm excited about it and excited for your journey. I want to thank you for making time today to come to the podcast. Uh, this is a pleasure for me and an honor to have you here. Thank you for making time. It was amazing. That's all thank I really you did. so much, Greg. It's really been great to talk to you. Oh, thank you. All right, everybody. That has been another episode of the Dr. Jones Optimization Academy. We can't wait to see you for our next episode. I want to say thanks again to Dr. Faree for coming through and blessing us with this great information. And we will see you all very, very soon. Take it easy.